Baptist Church, if you would stand with me, grab your hymnals, and turn them to hymn number 205. Hymn number 205, Faith is the Victory. Amen? Amen. to be in the Lord's house tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask his blessing. Lord, we thank you for this day. We pray you'd work in our hearts tonight. Thank you for your word that you've given us so that we can know you. And so I pray you do a great work in our hearts tonight. Encourage us and challenge us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm glad you're here on this evening. We're looking forward to what God has for us. Let's continue by singing our chorus. The words are on the back of your bulletin. So get your Bible ready. Get the new look from the old book. Get the new look from the Bible. Get the new look from the old book. Get the new look from the Bible. Get the new look from the old book. Get the new look from God's Word. The inward look, the outward. Turn to our next hymn, 433. About that chorus reminds me of a saying. Uh, preacher said, uh, if it's true, it ain't new, and if it's new, it ain't true. Amen. <laughs> 433. And uh, for this song, Miss Soundsley, I'll lead this. I uh, played in 3-4 a little, a little bit faster than, than what's written on the, on the thing. While we pray and while we plead, while we 
Confession make, come to Christ and point and take. Trust in Him from day to day, He will keep you all the way. Why not now? Why not now? Why not come to Jesus now? Why not now? Why not now? Why not come to Jesus now? Amen, and we can do that. Right now, amen. 233, our final hymn, Trusting Jesus. Trusting as the moments 
you for that song. That's what we need to have that kind of commitment. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter number 17. Acts chapter number 17. It's a passage we looked at a little bit this morning. Acts chapter number 17. And Brother John, uh, if you could help us with our scripture reading here this evening. John chapter 17, and then verses 19 through 23 is our scripture reading, Acts 17, verses 19 through 23. Acts chapter 17, verses 19 through 23. And they took him and brought him unto Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is. For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else, but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Mars Hill, and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. We consider this passage this morning in um, in talking about the different authorities that we have, and then uh, we looked at the fact of the unknown God that the Athenians did not know who the true God was. And so the Apostle Paul proclaimed who that true God was and the importance of seeking after God, that God requires everyone to seek after Him and to repent. The Athenians were only familiar with their own false deities, gods that they had created out of stone and wood and uh, precious metals, and they had made little figurines to be to represent what they pictured God to be. The challenge, though, is that when we picture, when we reduce God to something that that we can understand, then that that imagination of who we think God is is far below who God really is. God is so much more and greater than we can even imagine and we can even comprehend. And so that's why when you would go to the temple there in Israel, it would be the only temple really in the whole world where you would go to not have a statue. Because how could we encapsulate who God is in a figurine <coughs> such as a sun or an animal or a fish or a bird or some other created being? That cannot represent the true God, the Creator of the universe. And so they had a very wrong understanding of just who God is. And so the Apostle Paul proclaimed who God is. And a few were interested, but most really weren't all that interested. They were interested in hearing about something, um, something more novel than that. And so the Apostle Paul declared, here's the true God. Now when we come to our country here in the United States, there are uh, churches uh, in many communities and many, many of these different churches will say things like, we worship God, we're, this is a Christian church, and this sort of thing. And there's a general understanding in our country of the fact that there is a God. And that's a good thing. Some countries, such as Communist China, they do not allow people to truly worship God or believe in God. So I'm very thankful for that. Also, there's a familiarity with the Lord Jesus Christ. And most people have heard about the fact Jesus died on the cross, some people are still not sure why he died on the cross or what significance it would have because they haven't been saved. But at least they're in general familiar with Jesus and his teachings and the cross and the, uh, what some would call the Passion Week and those different events that took place. And so that's really good. But in our country here, many, many people do not understand who is the Holy Spirit and I believe that the Holy Spirit is the, is the unknown God in the sense of the part of the Godhead where people are just, they don't know anything about the Holy Spirit. Or if they do, what they know isn't, uh, is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible describes the fact that there, there is a trinity or the Godhead is the Bible term for it. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, one God revealed to us though in three 
different personalities with different uh, roles and different purposes. And the Holy Spirit is very much misunderstood in this country today. Why are there many difficulties in understanding the Holy Spirit in, in our, uh, here in America? Well, one reason is that there is really not a lot of publicity in the sense of the Scripture relating to the Holy Spirit Himself. We find in John chapter number 16, verses 13 through 14, and the Bible tells us here in John 16, how be it when He, is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth is come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall uh, whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. What we find is that the role of the Holy Spirit is not to magnify himself, but to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ and help people understand who is Jesus. But because of that, there's not as much attention given to the Holy Spirit. A second reason is because the Bible does not have as many images or word pictures to help us to understand the Holy Spirit. So we can consider in a relationship way that we've God the Father, and we can understand a human father and son, and so a little bit of an understanding there between God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son. We also have the picture of the church being the bride of Christ. Sin is pictured as a disease. We're pictured as sheep who can easily go astray. And then it comes to the Holy Spirit, and we don't have as much imagery. We do have the picture of the dove. We do have the uh, oil. But it's, it's a little bit, it's not as prevalent where it's not as easy to understand. Also, there's not as much understanding about the Godhead and how it relates. We have God the Father, the one, the originator of the plan of redemption. Jesus Christ, the second member of the Godhead, taking on human form, coming here to this earth, dying on the cross, being put in that grave, rising again from the dead, then ascended, uh, ascending back up into heaven. A lot of people understand better the relationship between God the Father and God the Son. So then, what's the role or responsibility of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is God within us. God, uh, Jesus Christ, was God here on this earth, Emmanuel, God with us, a God that we can understand or see as, we, as people saw Jesus Christ. But now, when it comes to the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is God within us. Now this is very important because the Christian life, living the Christian life, really comes down to yielding to the Holy Spirit. The basic understanding, and I could probably preach every single message for multiple years on end about dying to self, not following the flesh, but being alive or yielding to the Holy Spirit. That's really the Christian life in a nutshell. There's a lot of ways it's pictured, a lot of ways it's explained, but ultimately living the Christian life involves yielding to the Holy Spirit. And so we need to understand the role of the Holy Spirit. He's the comforter. He's the one that helps us feel comfortable doing what is right. Uh, I remember as a kid, my mom decided she wanted to teach me the trombone. I didn't, uh, normal, you know, normal families, you, you let the kids choose what they want to do. One day they just came home with a trombone. And my mom said, here, we got you this trombone. I just assumed that was normal. Uh, you know, the parents would do that. I guess they had borrowed some money from me. I was unaware of this. At this point, some money my great-grandparents had given me or something. So they bought me a trombone, and so my mom decided she was going to teach me how to do it. So we get to lesson number two or three, and my mom looks at the book, and she says, you know what? I had you holding that with the wrong hands, and I had the trombone twisted the, the way it's aligned. I had, it, I had it backwards, so we need to put it this way. And I held on to the trombone the correct way. You know what? It fell wrong. I was like, yeah, I, I don't want to play this instrument. This doesn't seem right. You know why it seemed right? Because I had learned wrong the first time. Then I had to unlearn the wrong way so that then I could then learn the right way how to hold the trombone. You know, there's a lot of things in life like that where you're going to say, you know what, this doesn't feel right for me to go and 
confess my sin, whether it's to God or someone else. You know, it doesn't feel right for me to humble myself and call upon God to, to help me in this time of need. Yeah, it may not feel right, but that just because it's unfamiliar doesn't mean that it's wrong, and that's what the Holy Spirit is to do. How many people really feel comfortable going and talking to someone at work or a neighbor or maybe somebody in the neighborhood about salvation? I'll just be honest, I feel a little nervous all the time. You know what? The Holy Spirit is there to help us feel comfortable doing the things that we, we're not going to feel comfortable doing in the flesh. And so it is God within us. The second difficulty in understanding the Holy Spirit is because there are many errors, doctrinal errors relating to the Holy Spirit. Some people believe this, that the Holy Spirit is a virtue. The Holy Spirit is a spirit in the sense of the spirit of love, a spirit of peace in all the world, and uh, those are very optimistic uh, uh, ideas. But the Holy Spirit is not just a virtue. The Holy Spirit is not just a, a warm, fuzzy sense of everything's going to work out okay and let's all be optimistic and good things are going to come our way. It was uh, Paul of, uh, Paul of Samosata that said that the Holy Spirit was merely a name for the grace which God poured out upon the apostles. Um, no, the Holy Spirit is not just grace. God gives grace, that's God's enabling. That grace comes by means of the Holy Spirit, but to reduce the Holy Spirit down to simply God working in our life is to dehumanize the Holy Spirit. The second error is the idea that the Holy Spirit is just an attribute. For example, there's wisdom. Proverbs says much about wisdom. Uh, wisdom is important. We need to seek after wisdom. And so the Holy Spirit is basically like wisdom. And so through you know, your own reasoning and so on, God helps you and you can become wise. And so the Holy Spirit is kind of like an attribute, a good attribute that you want like wisdom or some other good attribute or love, we'll all feel the Spirit and let's all sing a little song and, and everybody comes together. And so the Holy Spirit would be basically like an attribute. But again, no, that's incorrect. The Holy Spirit is not just an attribute. The result of the Holy Spirit working in us is not even just a one fruit of the Spirit in the, the way that we think of it. The Bible talks in two different epistles about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit, singular, of the Spirit is all of the things that are listed. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, patience, temperance. That's everything. That's the result of the Holy Spirit. But to just single any one of those things out and say, well, the Holy Spirit is just a virtue, it's just wisdom, it's just love, it's just peace, it's just... No, no, the Holy Spirit is much more than just those things. The result of us allowing the Holy Spirit to work in our life is character, it is attributes, godly attributes, but we can't confuse, uh, we can't confuse the two. The third error is that the Holy Spirit is part of creation. Some people actually believe, um, Origen was one of the um, church fathers, so-called church fathers, that followed along with this, and he said that the Holy Spirit was the most honorable of all the beings brought into existence through the Word, the Word being Christ. Well, there's a problem with that. You go back to Genesis and you see the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. God said, let us make man in our image. Who's the us and our? And there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. When Jesus Christ rose again from the dead, He didn't just rise from the dead. God the Father raised Him from the dead, and the Holy Spirit in, in, uh, energized Him so that He was able to rise from the dead. All three members of the Godhead were part of the resurrection. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is not just an attribute. The Holy Spirit is not just a part of creation. The Holy Spirit was part of creating all of creation. The fourth error in understanding the Holy Spirit is probably the most common, even in Bible preaching churches, and that is this, that the Holy Spirit is a force. The Holy Spirit is a force. And they, people would say, well, it's kind of like uh, the electricity. And so when you make the right decision, it's just like the switch 
on the wall is flipped and then the electricity surges through that and then you get certain results. Certain things happen, the light comes on, the fan turns on and starts working. Now, it is true that when we yield to the Holy Spirit, we die to self, we yield to the Holy Spirit, then God works supernaturally, spiritually in our life and God does that through the Holy Spirit. But we have to keep in mind, no, the Holy Spirit is not a force. Because what happens in, then is that people go on this search like they're looking for the Holy Grail or something, thinking, I got to have the power. I remember as a kid, there was a cartoon that was on. We didn't have a TV most of the time. But the only line I remember is this a muscle guy with a big sword. And what he would say is something about the power. And then he like the lightning would hit him and stuff like that. And we have, almost have like this Christian version of it. If you want to be a super Christian, then what you need to do is go on a pilgrimage. And so maybe you crawl on your hands and knees and you beg God, I, I need this power, I need this power. And you can reach this kind of second blessing. You can reach this super spiritual plateau whereby there's this amazing uh, energy that courses through your veins and you're like a super Christian now because you have made it to this super level Except that's, that's not what the Bible says. It, we're not on a search for power. What happens then is people think, hmm, I want this power. What do I have to do to get the power? What do I have to do so I can, so I can be successful in the Christian life, so I can see my prayers answered, so I can get what I want from life? What do I have to do? And perhaps you've heard stories about uh, unique experiences that people have had. No, the Holy Spirit, yes, enables us, yes, brings power to our life, but the Holy Spirit is not just an inanimate force like electricity that we either plug in or turn on. No, the Holy Spirit is much more than that. The Holy Spirit is God. See, if the Holy Spirit is just a force, then the force becomes something that we use for our own ends. That's the way electricity works. Nobody's ever said, oh, I wonder why, you know, we're not turning on the light very much to save electricity. I wonder how what the feelings are of the electricity. No, nobody cares because it's, it's just a force. It's an inanimate object. It is set up to make it so our lives are easier, so it is serving us. Well, that's not the way the Holy Spirit works. The Holy Spirit is not to make our lives easier or more convenient. The Holy Spirit is, uh, is God himself. The third thing we need to understand about the Holy Spirit is the importance. Why is this such an important subject? to understand the Holy Spirit. The first reason is because the Holy Spirit is the point at which the Godhead becomes personal to the believer. You see, God's up in heaven. It's hard for us to relate to God. We can care about God. We can try to imagine that God loves us, and that, that's great. Jesus Christ is a little easier for us to relate to. Jesus went through difficult times. He, he suffered, and, and he, we can understand how he can be familiar with some of the things that we are going through. But it's the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, God who is in us at the moment of, beginning at the moment of salvation that makes everything personal in our lives. Now this is, this is critically important because when we yield to the Holy Spirit, what we are doing is we are saying, I want the work of Jesus Christ to become active in my life. I want the plan that God has made of salvation and regeneration and consecration. I want that plan by means of the work of Christ to be active in my life. And so I want to yield to the Holy Spirit right now. See, when we yield to the Holy Spirit, we have to understand that the Holy Spirit is not just a force. The Holy Spirit, we relate to the Holy Spirit like we would relate to a person. We find that in Ananias and Sapphira in the early church, the church was growing and great things were happening. And Ananias and Sapphira sold a piece of property. Not necessarily anything wrong with that. They kept back part of the money. Not necessarily anything wrong with that. But what happened was they lied and said, oh yeah, we gave all the money. So Peter asked the first one, 
did you really sell the property for so much, this amount that you gave? Oh yeah, that's everything. Bang, they fell down dead. Next one comes in. It's like a rerun. Did you really sell the property for this much? Oh sure. Yeah, we, we were giving it all to the Lord. Such a sacrifice. Lied again. You know what Peter said? He said, you've not, he said, you've not uh, lied just unto God, or excuse me, not lied unto men, but you've lied unto God. Why? You can't lie or you can't offend a power like electricity. But we can grieve the Holy Spirit. We can sin against the Holy Spirit. Why? Because we relate to the Holy Spirit in the way we would relate to another person. You see, God has personality. What, what does that mean? When we think about a person, it's not normally we think of their picture. And we think, okay, here's this person. I can picture them in my mind. But what somebody looks like isn't necessarily really their, who they are. Somebody could get into, a, let's say, a very, very terrible accident and somebody could be in the hospital. They're not going to look anything the same. But they're still the same person. Their personality, they may not be feeling great, but their, their personality would still be there. The, uh, the things that they're interested in and the, uh, the things that are important to them, all of those things are going to be the same. See, the real us is what we would think of as our personality. And in that sense, we relate to the Holy Spirit like we would relate to another person. That's why the Bible talks about not grieving the Holy Spirit. Why should we not grieve the Holy Spirit? Because... The Holy Spirit can get offended, can get hurt in that sense. Why? Because the Holy Spirit cares about us. The electricity in the wall doesn't care. It's just a force. But the Holy Spirit cares. The Holy Spirit is concerned about what is going on. And at some point, so many Christians do not understand that, and they think the Holy Spirit is there to help them in some way to reach their goals and do whatever they think is important but not understanding, wait a minute, no, the, the Holy Spirit, I'm going to relate to the Holy Spirit like a person. Because of that, many Christians don't see the Holy Spirit work in their life. They don't see, they, they understand what God says, they see the promises that Christ has made, but they don't see very much happening in their life because they don't realize the importance of the Holy Spirit. The second reason a practical importance of understanding the Holy Spirit is because the Holy Spirit's work is more prominent now than the other members of the Trinity. So if we consider in the Old Testament, most of it has to do with God. We have different names for God, God the Father. We have, it, thus saith the Lord, comes up over and over again in the Old Testament. There's an emphasis, of course, on the nation of Israel, and so we can see that in the Old Testament. Well, what happens when you get to the New Testament? It doesn't say as much about God, and it says a lot more about Jesus. The first four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all about Jesus. And then even the book of Acts, the beginning of it, is all about Jesus. The book of Revelation, a part of it is about Christ. It's the revealing of who Christ is. Then you have the book of Hebrews. Hebrews is all about how Christ is better, better than the Old Testament priests, Moses, and so on, better than the angels. So the book of Hebrews is all about Christ. And then you see in the church epistles the application of living for God. Romans, the, doctrinal, the great doctrinal pillar in the uh, New Testament, the importance of salvation, justification by faith in what Christ has done for us. So we see, we see all of this emphasis in the New Testament on the Lord Jesus Christ. However, what happens is that when you get to the book of Acts, starting in chapter number 2, what happens? We now see another transition. Christ is ascended up into heaven, and the emphasis now becomes on the work of the Holy Spirit. The work of the Holy Spirit in people's lives, in revival, and seeing people saved. You see that emphasis as well in many of the church epistles about don't grieve the Holy Spirit, but yield to the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Why is that? Because the role of the Holy Spirit is more prominent in this moment we see the importance of evangelism that connects directly with the role of the Holy Spirit as well. So for us right now, the role of the Holy Spirit is a critical role to understand. 
And then the third reason of the importance of understanding the Holy Spirit is because the Holy Spirit is the way that we experience God today. Now, I know sometimes people think they focus too much on their experience and, well, I had this, here's how I felt and here's what I thought. But when it comes to salvation, we know that, that God everybody's experience of, of the details of where they were and the scripture, the exact scripture maybe that God used in their life might be a little bit different. But everybody gets saved the same way, by grace, through faith, in the finished work of Christ. And as well, <coughs> excuse me, as, well as that, nobody's going to be coming unto the Father unless the Holy Spirit draws them. There must be the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. So when it comes to our experience with God, I'm not really big on experiences and how we're feeling and, and focusing so much on that, but we have to understand that there is an aspect to that of the way that we experience God comes about by means of the Holy Spirit. So what does that mean for us? What it means for us is to understand that for us to experience revival, a true revival and a love for Christ, we must yield to the Holy Spirit. We must be sensitive to the Holy Spirit. You can't grieve a force, but you can grieve a person, someone with personality, someone who cares about us, someone who has plans for our life. And if we can summarize very simply, it all comes down to this. Are we going to yield to the Holy Spirit and listen to the still small voice of God? The Holy Spirit working in our heart, in our life. See, the Holy Spirit can guide us into all truth if we're willing to obey God's Word. The Holy Spirit is that point of action where everything takes place. So what happens during revival? The Holy Spirit's poured abroad. The presence of the Holy Spirit's known and, ex and, and experienced. But what, what that means is everything comes back to right now in this moment, are you going to yield to what the Holy Spirit wants to do? Are you going to do what God wants you to do by means of submitting to the Holy Spirit? Say, Holy Spirit, guide me and lead me in the way that you want me to go. I've got to make a decision. What do you want me to do? How important it is to understand Without the Holy Spirit, we would only have the flesh. We'd have no way of living the Christian life. God the Father cares for us. We have the Word of God, which is the, the, the written Word from the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus died on the cross, but it's the Holy Spirit that is the one who's the comforter, the enabler, the one who makes everything work of God's plan in our life personally so that we can see people saved. If you're hearing this message today, you might say, you know what, I don't think I ever heard anything about that, but it, something is definitely not right. That could be the Holy Spirit drawing you right now and encouraging you to get saved, to make that decision to say, I need to put my trust in Christ. If you know the Lord is Savior, it could be the Holy Spirit is working, convicting right now and saying, hey, something's not right. I want you to be able to get something right in this, in this moment. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Lord, we thank you that you care so much about us. Lord, that you did not want us to be alone, but that we thank you that you sent a comforter to be with us, to enable us, to help us to carry out the Christian life. Lord, we know we could not keep the law in and of ourselves. It would be impossible for us to do that and to, to keep the whole law. But thank you for sending the Holy Spirit, which brings life, which brings about regeneration, and brings about your grace in our lives. Help us to relate to the Holy Spirit in a biblical and a right way. We ask for your blessing now in this moment of invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together as we sing our invitation song, number 328. It's Have Thine Own Way, number 328. Thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, thou art the 
departure, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. While I am waiting, yielded and still, have thine own and try me, Master, today, whiter than snow, Lord, wash me just now, as in thy presence humbly I bow, have thine own way. Touch me and heal me, Savior. Every head bowed, every eye closed, the piano is continuing to play. Are you living the surrendered, spirit-filled life, life in the spirit? Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for our sins, and thank you for sending the Comforter to enable us to be able to do what you want us to do. Help us to live for you in, in a spirit of revival, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And you may be seated. And uh, Brother John, if you could help us with the offering here as well. I heard from the Myers, uh, they made it safely to Pennsylvania, They're doing well getting settled in there, so certainly continue um, being in prayer for them. And then um, also we're looking forward to next week with uh, Father's Day, so we're going to be recognizing our fathers, so looking forward to that as well. Also for our teens, don't forget about teen camp, and so be sure to be able to get your registration in, um, contact, uh, let me know today about that. Brother John, if you could please lead us in prayer for the offering. Spirit of the living God fall fresh on me. It's such a blessing to be able to see here. Certainly want to be encouraged to follow the Lord, be able to seek after Him. If there's any way it could be a help or blessing to you this week, please let me know and love to be able to, to do that. Let's stand together. We're going to sing our chorus. Don't forget, get your Bibles ready. Get the new look from the old book. Get the new look from the Bible. Get the new look from God's Word. 